The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the very first day of this very first session in this very new year, 2021. Here we are in January, the beginning of a new era with all kinds of things going on all around us. And yet within ourselves, we can touch a place of peace, a river of quiet joy, a freedom so that no matter how we are, where we are, what the circumstances of our life are, we are free in a way that is the only real freedom that can happen for people. It's not the kind of freedom of being able to do whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like it. We've seen the um, ramifications of that recently. Sometimes it doesn't work out so well. And it's still driven by ego, drawn by a, an assumption of, of a self-image that needs to be reinforced, uh, revered, protected, defended. But who we really are is so much more than that. And it is our work to find out what that is. We are taught from very early on, unless we have very unusual parents and very unusual situations in our lives, to develop our intellect in ways that we become dependent upon it. That we assume that how we uh, can function appropriately in the world is only through thinking. And very recently, someone sent a book that challenges that notion. This is called Seven and a Half Lessons to Learn About the Brain. And it's written by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is quite... Uh, and uh, an important um, scientist. She's both a psychologist and a neurologist, or uh, well, let's just say she's a neuroscientist. And uh, she's done a lot of research into the development of the brain and has some really interesting uh, theories about it that are apparently uh, upheld and they contradict um, some of the current theories about it, but it's very important in terms of our relationship with practice. This first chapter is the half a chapter that is in part of the seven and a half lessons about the brain. And let me share it with you. Once upon a time, the earth was ruled by creatures without brains. This is not a political statement just a biological one. One of these creatures was the Amphioxus. If you ever glimpsed one, you'd probably mistake it for a little worm until you notice the gill-like slits on either side of its body. Amphioxy populated the oceans about 550 million years ago, and they lived simple lives. An Amphioxus could propel itself through the water thanks to a very basic system for movement. It also had an exceedingly simple way of eating. It planted itself in the seafloor like a blade of grass and consumed any minuscule creatures that happened to drift into its mouth. Taste and smell were of no concern because an amphioxus didn't have senses like yours. It had no eyes, just a few cells to detect changes in light and it couldn't hear its meager um, nervous system included a tiny clump of cells that was not quite a brain. An amphioxus, you could say, was a stomach on a stick. Amphioxy are your distant cousins. And they're still around today. When you look at a modern amphioxus, you behold a creature very similar to your own ancient tiny ancestor who roamed the same seas. 
Can you picture a little wormy creature two inches long, swaying in the current of a prehistoric ocean and glimpse humanity's evolutionary journey? It's difficult. You have so much more, so much that that ancient Amphioxus didn't. A few hundred bones, an abundance of internal organs, some limbs, a nose, a charming smile, and most important, a brain. The Amphioxus didn't need a brain. Its cells for sensing were connected to its cells for moving. So it reacted to its watery world without much processing. You, however, have an intricate, powerful brain that gives rise to mental events as diverse as thoughts, emotions, memories, and dreams. An internal life that shapes so much of what is distinctive and meaningful about your existence. Why did a brain like yours evolve? The obvious answer is to think. It's common to assume that brains evolved in some kind of upward progression, say from lower animals to higher animals, with the most sophisticated thinking brain of all the human brain at the top. After all, thinking is the human superpower, right? Well, the obvious answer turns out to be wrong. In fact, the idea that our brains evolve for thinking has been the source of many profound misconceptions about human nature. Once you give that cherished belief, give up that cherished belief, you will have taken the first step toward understanding how your brain actually works and what's it, what its most important job is and ultimately what kind of creature you really are. And then she goes on to uh, go through the, the development of creatures as they progressed from the most simple creatures like that Amphioxus to human creatures. And how, what came forth and the need for development had to do with basically taking care of the physical needs of the entity of the body. Let's continue. 500 million years ago, as little Amphioxy and other simple creatures continued to dine serenely on the ocean floor, the earth entered what scientists called the Cambrian period. During this time, something new and significant appeared on the evolutionary scene, hunting. Somewhere, somehow, one creature became able to sense the presence of another creature and deliberately ate it. Animals had gobbled one another before, but now the eating was more purposeful. Hunting didn't require a brain, but it was a big step toward developing one. The emergence of predators during the Cambrian period transformed the planet into a more competitive and dangerous place. Both predators and prey evolved in uh, to sense more of the world around them. They began to develop more sophisticated sensory systems. Amphioxy could distinguish light from dark, but newer creatures could actually see. Amphioxy had simple skin sensation, but newer creatures evolved a fuller sense of their body movements in the water and a greater sense of touch that allowed them to detect objects by vibration. Sharks today still use this kind of touch sense to locate prey. With the arrival of greater senses, the most critical question in existence became, is that blob in the distance good to eat or will it eat me? Creatures who could better sense their surroundings were more likely to survive and thrive. The Amphioxus may have been a master at it in its environment, but it couldn't sense that it even had an environment. These new animals could. The hunters and the hunted, hunted also received a boost from another ability, more sophisticated kinds of movement. For the Amphioxus, whose nerves for sensing and moving were woven together, movement was extremely basic. Whenever its stream of food became a trickle, it wriggled in a random direction to plant itself in another spot. Any looming shadow prompted his body to dart away. In the new world of hunting, however, predators and prey alike began to evolve more capable systems for movement or motor systems to navigate with greater speed and dexterity. 
These newer animals could dart, turn, and, and dive deliberately toward things like food and away from things like threats in ways that suited their environment. Once creatures could sense at a distance and make more sophisticated movements, evolution favored those who performed their tasks efficiently. And why are we going into this? Because what she's moving toward is how the body developed increasingly sens sens sensibly or sensitively and it wasn't in order to think about our situation. It was, as she puts it, uh, like a, a um, well, taking in and taking out. Like what you do with your checkbook. What comes in is marked down or noted and what goes out is marked down and noted. And the two have to balance or you're in trouble. And so it is with our bodies. The, the chemicals that fuel our bodies, the fact that our bodies need to be fueled at certain points in time, that at, at certain, certain exertions require replenishment. Well, any exertion requires a replenishment of energy and, and so on. And so our bodies, she feels, developed for that purpose. And the thinking capacity was, in a sense, an accessory. It wasn't the main purpose of the brain development. Now, what that tells us is something we already know if we're sensitive enough, and that is that there is a way to comprehend that does not require thinking. Some segments of society, Native Americans, for example, are known to, when their children get to that age, right around three, where they can talk, and they start asking why. Why is the sky blue? Uh, why does my stomach rumble when I eat? And so on and so forth. Uh, and their parents, rather than saying, well, because, or God made it so, or any of the other answers we like to give because we really don't know, but we want to feel important enough. They say, go into the forest and be really quiet. And the trees and the bushes will tell you the answer. And so Native Americans as a culture in general, and, and that's just a generalization. And nowadays, of course, we have modern society and some of that is being lost. But, but uh, my experience with Native Americans, and we have a number of Native American women that come to our Regaining Balance retreats for women veterans with PTSD. And also because there are many Native Americans in New Mexico, one encounters uh, Native Americans of the various tribes and pueblos and day to day practically. And with many of them, there is a deep sense of presence. And that deep sense of presence comes from increasingly activated a part of our beingness, a part of our brain actually is our, our right, right brain um, that is, is the part of the brain that understands beyond words and can comprehend beyond words, but it cannot express through words. Words are the province of our left brain, which also is good at puzzles, which is why uh, some people are good at languages, because that's a puzzle. And it is, it is good at, at language, because language is a puzzle, at understanding spoken words. But the right brain is very good at understanding 
what is beyond words, energies, situations, subtle things. And it is also the doorway to opening to an understanding of who and what we really are. Because we cannot think our way there. This is what koans are about. This is why koans are so perplexing. Uh, does a dog have the Buddha nature? No. Does a dog have the Buddha nature? Yes. At the same time. Now, how can you put that together? Or form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Huh? And yet, these can be understood, but they cannot be understood in the realm of words and concepts. And who we really are and the freedom that comes from comprehending that cannot come from words and con concepts. This is why Bodhidharma said that uh, Zen is beyond words and letters. This is why when he, he finally ended up in China and found himself in the court before the emperor uh, Wu of Liang, and uh, he was trying to teach the emperor that same sense, but the emperor didn't get it. And the emperor said, well, you know, who are you then if you're not somebody famous and and uh, the master of this Zen? And Bodhidharma famously said, I don't know. And that I don't know is a very important statement because we have to not know. We have to be unattached to some idea of who we are, what things are, in order to find out who we really are, the deepest truth. And of course, Bodhidharma realized that the emperor really wasn't ready to take on Zen practice. And he went on to sit in a cave for nine years until finally Ekadaishi appeared, who had spent 30 years studying a sutra, putting down words about it, analyzing it. And he finally came to Bodhidharma because he said, my mind is not at peace. Please give it peace. All those words, all that analysis, all that fame that he had, had not given him peace because it all had been basically at a certain level in terms of Zen practice superficial because we cannot find it through words. And yet we keep trying. My mind is not at peace, please bring it peace. And Bod Bodhidharma said, bring me your mind and I'll give it peace. And after some time, Ekadaishi said, we can't find it. And Bodhidharma said, there, I've given it peace. But of course, the habit patterns of confusion and attachment and all the rest come rolling back in. And this happens as well uh, after we've had a Kensho experience. In order to break through, we have to let go all of this cogitation temporarily. Yes, thinking is valuable. It has a place in life and society. And unfortunately, it's not a, 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 the only thing in the, in the book. There are other ways to understand that can be far deeper and far more freeing. And in order to reach that place, we have to let go of that uh, calculating intellect. We have to let go temporarily of the identity of being somebody, which is 
basically a story that is a set of conclusions drawn as a, as a result of our, our history and what we've been taught. And in order to find out who we really are, we have to let that go. It doesn't work any other way. We cannot um, have our feet planted in, in the world of uh, form and in the world of emptiness at the same time. Even though form is empty and emptiness is form. So this is why Sissokan is so vital. This is why this, this uh, tuning in, extending the out breath, which of course works to uh, focus our mind in very powerful ways, uh, ways that are hard to do any other way, really. As we extend the out breath, in order to extend it far enough, we, we have to let go other concerns, other things going on at the same time. We cannot multitask and do susokan properly. And if you find yourself multitasking while, quote, doing susokan, you're not really doing susokan. And you're robbing yourself of, of a, a wonderful tool. So we extend the out breath, but it needs to be accompanied by this, this sense of perplexity, a sense of yearning. Form and is emptiness. Emptiness is form? How, what? And, and a, a sense of needing to know, a sense that there's something beyond what we ordinarily would assume, what we ordinarily would experience that is really vital to return to. And we take that yearning, whatever we want to call it, and, and it doesn't have to have a name, that sense, that, that question, that perplexity, and we let it ride on the extended out breath, reaching through that beyond where we know anything. And we keep doing it, and we keep doing it, and we keep doing it. And as we get increasingly concentrated, we may find ourselves disappearing. It's called a deep samadhi. And it's essential in order to come to awakening. You have to let go the cherished view in order to open to what's really there. And then, of course, as you've heard so many times, there's a lot of important work to do after that. Of course, there's a lot of important work to do before that as well. But the main point I'm trying to get across is it's not about thinking about things. It's not about analyzing. It's not about trying to figure out the answer to your chemistry test. It takes a different way of using your brain, a different part of the brain, really, to, to do this work. And people who are intuitive have a leg up on it because they already have a sense of how to access that, that way of working, that way of exploring, that way of being beyond words. But that's what it takes. And? as you get more deeply into it, you will realize that it is incredible and it works. And little by little, you become free. So that's, that's basically it. That is how to come to awakening. Abandon words and letters, as Bodhidharma said, let go the urge to think your way through to it. Let go the stories because our mind is so good at bringing up stories. We, we feel alive when we've got stories, even, even if they're unpleasant stories. Gossip is really titillating because it's, it's, it's stories. It's, it's interesting stories to let go all of that way of, uh, of searching in the 
process of coming to awakening in the process of doing your 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 work on the cushion then when you're not on the cushion when you have to read a legal abstract and comment on it for example when you have to develop a, a teaching plan for example or any of the other things that we we are able to use our intellect well for then you can do it even more effectively because you won't have the drag of the yada yada that's going on behind the scenes the habitual self-talk because as you go deeper and deeper into your practice through the susokkan that begins to thin out you begin to get more comfortable with not having that background noise you begin to get more comfortable with with silence inner silence and that's a big step along the way so we have six more days in which to really dive into this exciting process and we also have a lot going on in the outside world that certainly would be i would assume motivated motivating to to many of us at least if not all of us to find some level of inner peace to find some relief from the tension the stress the fear the anxiety So give yourself to that extended out breath fueled by the need to know the need to be free the need to understand this deeper truth that we all sense is and together we support each other helping so go for it Thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows. <laughs>